Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's Ag Forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions, your premier platform for real-time global insights. Well, as we begin a new month here, I thought it'd be kind of fun to take a look at the climatological difference between the temperatures on October 1st versus October 31st here for the globe. So that's what the map shows. It's the difference. You can clearly see the division here between the northern and southern hemispheres as you see this, much of the southern hemisphere warming by several degrees as they begin uh, you know, their spring. And as the northern hemisphere then plummets through fall, our temperature changes are quite dramatic during this month. Just to show what they look like across parts of North America here, I kind of labeled a few of the contours so you could see this. By the end of the month, we typically expect temperatures to drop off across most of the United States and Canadian prairies here between 12 and 20 degrees. So that's what the temperature change will look like by the end of the month of October. So what we're going to do is we're going to be kind of taking a look here to see what would upset the normal. That's always what we do in atmospheric sciences. Where do we look for deviations from climatology? Now, speaking of climatology, I just want to make sure that you see this map once again. This is from uh, Brian Brett Schneider. Uh, he works up in Alaska, and he's got a great view here to show you uh, the average data of the first freeze of the season. And we do know that much of uh, parts of the Canadian prairies getting into the high plains, the northern plains of the United States, and even some of the Great Lakes states have already had their first uh, frost of the season. But this map just once again kind of reinforces what those climatological normals look like. Quick review again, I showed you this on Monday, but want to give you the full update on the month of September. These are the temperature ranks by climate district for September. We can clearly see how warm the western United States was, and with some frequent intrusions of some cooler air in the central plains spreading to the east, we see that a lot of the eastern two-thirds of the country here spent the month of September uh, favoring cooler than average weather than above average weather. If we just take a look at why that is, I made a composite map here showing you the jet stream flow throughout the month of September. And you can just kind of follow the, the colors here to kind of see what the mean flow of the atmosphere really looked like. But sometimes it's useful to, to compare the average uh, to, to the anomalies. And this is really what set September apart from other months. You see, this is the anomalies. These are the differences from normal when looking at the jet stream flow. And a couple of things to point out. Some of the sources of that colder air, well, look what happened here on the backside of this ridge. We at a few times had some uh, very strong winds compared to normal in the jet stream level that were coming here here out of the north racing through the central plains of the United States and cutting into uh, the, the southeast. We can also see the anomalously high atmospheric heights and the circulation around it that sat here over the west and that was one of the reasons why we had such a stagnant and hot pattern across the western United States which of course has led to so much forest fire activity. So very interesting to compare September to normal here. Well, our jet stream flow today looks something like this, and it's going to look like this for the next couple of days before things start to moderate. And it's a highly amplified, very meridional, that means north-south uh, setup here. And this deep trough that is over the Great Lakes is going to be around for at least the next four to five days as we continue to deal with um, uh, the, the changes in temperature across the eastern half of the United States, which have put us over into pretty cold weather. While the heat builds back to the west, this particular pattern has got northwest flow. This is very... Uh, um, uh, in the upper levels of the atmosphere, very convergent flow in this area. And that tends to mean that on the back side uh, of this trough, we're going to see some drier conditions, whereas on the eastern side of it, we're going to see some wetter conditions. This pattern also has an influence on what's coming out of the tropics. And we're going to talk about that in a few moments as well. First things first, this was yesterday's satellite animation. Just as the sun was setting, I'll pause it right here. You can watch this once again. You can see the deep upper level low. So that is in that deeper trough. And there were some scattered showers that did come through. Uh, in this area around the Great Lakes due to that. But the main frontal boundary had pushed off of the coast here. As the sun sets once again, I just want to pause it right there at the very end, and we can see the um, air quality issues we're still having from the fires in the western part of the United States, specifically California. But also notice the extent of the smoke coming out of the fires in Utah and the border here of Wyoming and Colorado. That smoke spreading here across a big section of the southern plains. To see where that smoke is going here over the next day and a half or so, this is just the high resolution uh, rapid refresh model telling you what that smoke spread is going to look like. And you saw here the smoke in California spreading to the north, going into parts of kind of the I-5 corridor over to the Columbia Basin here, decreasing, uh, decreasing air quality issues uh, in that area as the ridge builds. And then on the downstream side of it, you can see the, the flow pushing that smoke through Colorado and here into the Panhandle of Oklahoma and Texas, even stringing it out at times all the way down to the Gulf Coast. So that's what we're watching in terms of smoke here. All right, this upper level pattern is, is moving quite a bit, and we need to assess what the major features are and what to be on the lookout for. 
the blocking upstream that you're going to see develop over Europe is going to be critical uh, for, I think, what's going to happen here across North America for a while. But I'm going to reiterate a point I made uh, yesterday in the long range analysis, and that is to watch what keeps happening here in the Gulf of Alaska. Very quickly, some of the things we're seeing here in the Gulf of Alaska are in tune with the La Nina that's developing down in the Central Pacific and the lack of, of sea ice here in the Chukchi Sea and, and the enormous gradient in temperature between there uh, and the Bering Sea. I think that's what's going to keep reinvigorating troughs in this area. Okay, with all that said, let's play this forward. You notice that as we work our way just through the end of this week and weekend, we continue to see our deeper trough settling in here over the Great Lakes states. We're going to talk about what that means in temperatures in a few moments. We see the block upstream. Do you see it here? There's this big ridge north of Scandinavia and the trough that's cutting into Europe. That's going to keep things very cool and unsettled for Western Europe, but warm and dry for Eastern Europe getting into the Russian wheat belt. But as I said, as we go out here past this weekend, so this is now getting into Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday of next week, we once again see a reinforcing shot at some cooler air, but this time not so deep into the south. And as a result, this is going to kick farther off to the north and east, and the pattern's going to try to relax after that. We still have our upstream block, but this trough at least tries to move here into the Canadian Maritimes, into the North Atlantic. And while that's all occurring, this jet stream kind of relaxes and flattens out, we are going to see some warmth spreading here across the United States into next week. But watch again, you see our trough developing here. This is going to be pushed along by some strong jet stream winds. And by Saturday, you know, October the 10th, we're going to kick another trough into the Pacific Northwest, increasing precipitation chances there. But this kind of flat, really blah flow across the midsection of the United States, I don't know if that's a meteorological term or not, but it's going to just keep things relatively dry in this area. And I'll show you exactly what I'm talking about here in a few moments. Let's get into temperatures first. We can see that the National Weather Service does have frost advisories out for a large area and freeze warnings in this darker shade that you see here in Minnesota, Wisconsin, and back into parts of Nebraska. Now, this is for tomorrow morning. That's when we're going to be watching for the coldest air. That'll be Friday morning. These are air quality alerts here in the western part of the United States for that smoke that you just saw. So let's talk minimum temperatures first. On the high plains today, we could see a, a frost in this area where we've already seen a frost so far this year. But as we play this forward, I'll pause it right here on Friday morning, the National Digital Forecast Database, you can see I put a white contour. I know it's a bit messy, but I put a white contour everywhere that we expect to see temperatures uh, at freezing or below. And so you can see why the National Weather Service has got this area on the lookout here for a frost early tomorrow morning. After that, let's go into the day on Saturday. It's frost threat's going to spread to northern Minnesota, northern Wisconsin, and um, uh, even down into the, the lower part of Michigan here. That's going to be a pretty chilly morning, though, across much of the eastern part of the country. But as we go from there into Sunday, again, we're going to watch the northern plains for another frost event. But then if you get past Sunday, look at the pattern begin to relax here. This is Monday's lows, Tuesday, Wednesday. Sorry, I did that kind of fast there, but you can see the change here. And what it does for our high temperatures, well, here's the high temperatures today. The colors tell you the difference from normal. So very warm here in the Central Valley of California today. Temperatures cranking up and, uh, you know, close to that triple digit mark. But as we play this forward, watch as we go from today on Thursday into Friday's temperatures, Saturday. Now watch the warmth begin to spread from the west to the east as we get past the weekend. So here's Sunday, Monday, look at that, Tuesday, and Wednesday. So that's that opening up of that uh, deep, uh, excuse me, the movement of the deep trough out of the northeast and the opening of the ridge in the west. You can see out in the day six through 10, both models are really picking up on kind of a spread to the east of that warmer weather. And the day 11 to 15, that's when we now have the jet stream wanting to do something a bit more like this, since in both models that that occurs. So this is what brings in the unsettled weather into the Pacific Northwest, but keeps things open and warm in terms of jet stream flow across the United States. So now let's turn our attention to precipitation. Over the last 72 hours, as that deep trough has developed here uh, over the Great Lakes states, we can see out ahead of it the moisture with that front as it pushed through, bringing in some needed rain into parts of the northeastern United States. Just to show you again how things look for the month of September, we know that uh, we were influenced by Tropical Storm Beta that did this, Hurricane Sally did, that did that, which really cut hard through parts of the Cotton Belt. There was a pretty dry strip in through here, which we analyzed on Monday, and it's been dry uh, 
uh, compared to normal in, in the central plains as well. Some of the wetter conditions you see here in Iowa, northern Illinois, and Wisconsin, this was from that deep cutoff low that cut in like this way back at the beginning of September. But the southwestern United States, some of the driest weather we have on record. Okay, some neat stuff here to analyze when we think about the, the, the seasonal change. This is what August jet stream pattern looks like. It's weak. Can you see it? It's just the flow coming across here from the Pacific and then right here across North America into the North Atlantic. Now, here's a couple of things that are going to change as you go from August to September. First of all, the jet stream winds start to pick up in speed. And this is this part of the seasonal change. From there, going to September to October, watch this. Notice how the jet stream winds in the Northern Hemisphere also begin to move south. So yet again, I'll go back September, October, September, October, and they begin to pick up speed. And by the time we get into November, they even move farther south and even get faster. We start to see the development of our subtropical jet stream as well, which is critical for returning rain to California. So thinking about that, is there anything to upset that normal transition? And as we've been talking about so much lately, our La Nina is quite robust. Uh, we have very strong trade winds in here. The Southern Oscillation Index right now is at a plus 10, and we have um, uh, water temperatures here averaging between minus 0.8 and minus 1 degrees Celsius, which is a very robust La Nina in this area. Yes, it's still warm in the North Pacific, and it's warm where we develop our hurricanes, but certainly this La Nina tends to be a more dominant feature. So what does it tend to do? Well, it tends to give us a jet stream pattern that does something a bit like this, which means very weak compared to normal flow here across the much of the United States with more troughing happening uh, in and around the Gulf of Alaska, which is what we talked about at the beginning of this. Now, these correlations are not strong. I want to make sure that's very clear. Transition season correlations with La Nina are weak, but if it is the more dominant feature in our pattern, we want to be able to discuss it. So with that, let's talk about precipitation. This is an animation over the next week of how much precip we're expecting to accumulate from the European model. We have good multi-model agreement on this, and we've also got really good um, uh, uh, what we call deprog DT. So in other words, the last couple of runs have really agreed with this. As you can see, if I just step you back here, we do have, okay, so here's our trough over the next couple of days, just still adding light rain into this part of Ontario, Quebec, and then getting over to the Great Lakes states. We're going to watch for a week low on Friday into Saturday to kind of sneak out of Saskatchewan, cutting through the central plains, possibly increasing rainfall for parts of Iowa, Illinois, Missouri, and then right down here into parts of the Mid-South, including Arkansas, back over toward, um, uh, you know, this part of Oklahoma. But we're very dry in the Central Plains, and this is critical for the wheat crop that needs to get planted here, this dryness that we've experienced. And again, as I play this out, you can see things stay relatively dry, at least through October the 7th. Now, to show you uh, what's going to happen with that pattern, look at how windy things will be in this corridor as this pattern becomes established. So expect to continue to see strong winds from the southern Canadian prairies through the northern plains of the U.S. right here through the Corn Belt and into the northeast. From there, though, I would like to show you what the precipitation patterns look like. So we're going to do this relatively quickly, okay? This is uh, Thursday morning. As we play this forward for the next couple of days, we continue to see scattered showers here. There is a low that is trying to develop right here on the backside at that deeper trough Friday into Saturday. So we're going to see scattered showers in through this area as we work our way into Saturday morning. This is now Saturday afternoon and evening. As we then get toward a Sunday morning, afternoon, and evening, you can see the high pressure building in here. And we're also going to be watching for some, well, it could be some tropical thunderstorms that kind of spread through parts of Florida but get pulled into the jet stream and race just along the east coast. Now with higher pressure building in here, look at this, this is Monday morning. On the back side of that, there's going to be some very strong winds coming out of the south. That's that big warm up, but very windy conditions in through this area by the time we get in through the day on Monday. At that time period, we do see the pattern continues to move. And you notice that our next couple of lows that come through try to stay closer to the U.S.-Canada border next week as the jet stream pattern relaxes. But we're going to keep sending these things into the northeastern part of the United States. As we look out exclusively into week two, this is where the pattern sets us up again with a deeper trough in the west. The GFS has it, the European has it, and the pattern is going to try to relax across the U.S. So what does that give us? It gives us this precipitation pattern for week two. This gets us all the way out to the 15th here over in the European model. 
Wetter in the northwest, maybe wetter than normal in Northern California as well. But as I said, drier in through the midsection of the country, both models picking up on that. Let's talk for a moment about what's going on in the tropics here. The National Hurricane Center has really increased the probability of getting some tropical thunderstorm development right here. This has been wavering between 70 and 90% in their forecast. And there's also a little disturbance here that they're gonna keep an eye on getting into the Caribbean. But the Caribbean is the only place where I think these systems can form right now. Because over the next several days, this is a map of wind shear. Look at how high the wind shear values are as this trough develops. So it's only going to be in this area that the wind shear is going to be low enough uh, for potential development. And this jet stream is going to grab something that forms in here and take it off in that direction. So we can see here, this is where we're going to watch for formation, but I'm just going to say that'll be the corridor through which anything that forms would eventually track. Notice not a lot of action going on out here in the central Atlantic, and that's partly due to where the MJO is stuck over here here in phase four, five, and six. As we talked about yesterday in the long range, that tends to produce a lot of suppression in the upper levels of the atmosphere here across the area that I just shaded. And that includes this region of, uh, of the Atlantic. Now remember, as we move into October, we watch for a lot of homegrown systems that come out of this part of the Caribbean Gulf and Western Atlantic. And we are by no means done with this tropical season. I want to finish up with just a quick international perspective, just to reiterate some stuff I talked about yesterday in the long range. It has been very dry in the Russian wheat belt, the southern Russian wheat belt. As you can see here, they've built up a sizable deficit in precipitation during uh, the last 45 days or so, some places getting less than 20% of normal rainfall. The deep troughs that cut into Europe are going to keep things very unsettled, cold and wet inside the area I just circled. But on the uh, eastern edge of this, it's going to stay dry. So you can see Ukraine wet on the western side and drier on the eastern side. So this will be critical for watching what's going on with wheat over here. From that point, I want to take you to South America. And I just want to show you the next 10 days from the European model continues to keep a broad sector here of, um, of Brazil on the drier side of things. It's also quite warm in that area compared to normal, so very hot and dry. So this is delaying the start of the monsoon. When this becomes critical is if we are still having this conversation on October 20th, or if we're really having it on November 1st, that the monsoon is not fully established, then that's when it's going to be problematic for getting the beans in quickly, which could impact yield and also the planting of the safrina crop. I'll say this, I showed you this yesterday in the long range, the monsoon should be kicking up. As you see here, climatologically, the precipitation amounts should be increasing, but notice we have a pretty sizable deficit here as we should be beginning the wet season in Mato Grosso. So with that international perspective, we'll go ahead and wrap this one up. Hope you all have a great week, uh, rest of your week and weekend, and we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you.